Thank you. Please be seated. As I often remind you, each week we do have a report for you on the back page of our worship folder uh, that keeps you up to date with all of our missions offerings. The uh, dimes for missions, in case you're not uh, uh, familiar with that, we uh, take all of the dimes that happen to come in the offering, and many people actually deliberately hoard dimes through the week, if I may put it that way, and we put that aside, and then every year that goes to our coats for the community uh, mission. Now, many of our coats, for example, are donated, but that often leaves us with, with uh, sizes that we don't have. So that's when we actually go out and uh, try to buy coats of that size to fill in uh, when it's needed. If you've never been here when we've had the coats set up, you, you have the opportunity because we will be probably uh, giving them out one Saturday in January, probably. We turn our fellowship hall into a great big outlet mall. I mean, there are racks everywhere with coats from this size to, well, anyway, you, you get the picture. So thank you for participating in that ministry. As an offshoot of that, we now have, of course, our free clothing ministry. And on the 16th of uh, September, we will be having a fundraiser for that. Um, you do not have to make an RSVP. There are no advanced tickets. You simply pay at the door. And uh, I talked with Deb this morning about a reduced rate for children, and certainly that will be the case uh, that we'll let you know about. So I love ministries where someone says, look, here's something that needs done. Why don't we do it? And then they become the spark plug and they, uh, their enthusiasm spills over to this person and that person. And pretty soon we have a whole new ministry. And guess what? We didn't have five committee meetings and two called church conferences. We just started doing it. And it has been a wonderful direct ministry to our community. And I thank you for your part in all of those. And we are very privileged to worship God with our tithes and offerings. <laughs>
us pray together. Heavenly Father, and we are the managers of all that you entrust to us. Help us to live for you each day and to generously share the time, talents, and treasures you have given us. We pray this in the name of Jesus, who gave us life eternal. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Our announcer is not here today, so I'll have to say it. It's time for the Lambs Club. So I want all the lambs to come forward. All right, ooh. (laughs) Um, We're missing something. Hmm, where's where's Lucy Lamb? Could could I have two or three of you to come up here and bring all the lambs down that are behind the pulpit? Okay, come on, come on. Are they always this shy? (laughs) Oh. Yeah, just take all of them. Yeah, hop up. I'm I'm getting lazy, and I want you to do the work for me because we have collected a huge number of lambs. Now, put put them here on the table. This, this particular one, that's Lucy Lamb. Let me sit behind you there. Okay, now we want all the littler people up front and the ones that are taller, if you'll be behind them, okay? So everybody can see. Um, how many of you walked to church today? Anybody? None of you. How did you get here? Car. In a car. Okay. Oh or an SUV or whatever, okay. On the way, did you see any danger signs like there's a curve ahead or? We we went over a hill. Over a hill. And me too. And you too, were you together? No. Oh, you weren't, okay. (laughs) And then it also tells you how fast you're supposed to go. And if you go over that speed, that's not good. That, Lucy Lamb would never approve that because we're supposed to be kind every day. Well, let me tell you a story. Long time ago, when ships would sail on the ocean, they didn't have modern technology to tell them how close they were to the land. And, of course, a ship doesn't want to get real close to the land because they might go aground. So do you know what they built as a warning to the ships? What? Uh, I'll be calm. Yes. Since, would you go right around the corner and bring that? There's something right around the corner. Bring that out for me, would you? Up, up on the top here. Just, can, can you come up here? I mean, you can walk up the steps. <laughs> That's, the steps are too easy. Okay, go right around the corner and bring that big thing over. It's not heavy. Would someone want to help her? So this is what they designed. Was Now, what do you call that? A lighthouse. A lighthouse. The light was up here, and it it would go back and forth. And when a ship saw that, they said, oops, we better be careful because that's land and we don't want to go on land. Now God also has warning signs for us. He doesn't want us to be mean to people. He doesn't want us to disobey our parents or our teachers, but he wants us to be good members of the Lamb's Club, being just 
kind to everybody that you see. Now, if you remember, oh, it's a stretch. If, do you know what what's this is? What's this money for? This is for the Lambs Club Mission Project. And we're collecting money to buy some chickens and some uh, rabbits for our friends in Haiti. Now, we don't want dimes because the dimes go to another mission. So, Lucy Lamb needs some help. I'm going to give each one of you a crisp new dollar bill. They were just printed last Monday, so they're brand new. <laughs> and I want you to get some help from somebody to go into a bank and bring back either Besides a dime, what, what are the other coins? A penny, Quarter. quarters, yeah. nickels, or even half dollars. All right, there you are. Okay, there you are. There you are, okay. Okay. Now, yeah, let's see. Okay, now if you don't get to spend that before you go home, you can, you can take it home as a souvenir. Some of these children are from the Netherlands, so they're go they have a limited time to uh, get the money. Here you are, sweetie. Okay, everybody got one? Okay, it's time to pray. Got lots of people to pray today. Just hold somebody's hand, okay? Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus, we love you, we love you and we thank you, we thank you for loving us. For loving us. Help, us Help us to be a good member, be a good member of the Lion, Lambs Club. Of the Lambs Club. Lambs Club. <laughs> oh, man. I almost said Lions Club. <laughs> God bless you. Have fun today, okay?
Thank you. Please be seated. <clears throat> you will notice on our prayer guide that I have repeated the uh, prayer guide of church leadership once again because our boards and committees are continuing the process of looking for leaders for the coming years. So please uh, pray for them. I did have uh, one other uh, prayer request. Uh, some of you may have known Mike Stevens, who died recently. Uh, he was the stepson of Bill Blake, who is, worships with us quite often, and we certainly offer their family our condolences. These uh, care and concern outreach cards that you have in front of you, several years ago, after everybody had gone, I found this one, and I kept it. I keep it in my, my little book that I put my sermon in just to remind me that we don't know the kinds of hurt and needs of people who come to our services. Here's what this person wrote. I don't, I don't know who, who it came from. Please pray for me. I feel so empty, like a void in my chest, sucking everything that is in me. Please, I'm tired of feeling empty. Let's pray for each other. Our Heavenly Father, it gives us great joy that we can lift up hearts and minds and even our hands in praise and thanksgiving to your holy name. We thank you that you are an all-wise, all-powerful God and that your plans are perfect, that you see the future that we cannot see. And so we give you praise upon praise and adoration. Our Father, we realize that life can be so fragile to so many people who maybe are going day to day as if they were hanging from a thread. We pray for those people, O oh Lord. Our hearts reach out to them. We don't always know who they are, but when we do, may we in kindness and in love and affection let them know that we're willing to walk alongside with them. We can't change the facts, we can't change the future, but we can certainly make the present a little bit more comfortable for them. That's what we are here for as a church, O oh God, to look out after each other. We thank you for these precious little lambs who come forward every time we have a meeting of the club that we're trying to remind them that kindness is the way we ought to live each day. There's too much hatred, there's too much disagreement, too much nastiness, too much putting down of other people and calling them names. We need to do away with that, Lord, and we can't control what any other person does, but we certainly can work on our own self. We pray for our nation, oh God. We pray for our president and all of the leaders on the national level. We play, pray for our, may, our governor and all the leaders on the state level. We pray for our mayor and all leaders here on the, the local level. We pray for those within our church congregation who have responsibilities. We pray for our coming search process for our new church secretary. And we pray many, many blessings and days of happiness for our dear friend Margaret. Oh Lord, take us. Use us as you see fit. And we pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.
A thousand stories of what they think you're like, but I've heard the tender whispers of a love in the dead of night, and you tell me that you're pleased and that I. good father it's who you are it's who you are it's who you are and I'm loved by you it's who I am it's who I am it's who I am I see many searching This morning's scripture lesson comes from Acts chapter 7, verses 54 through 60. If you'd like to follow along, it's page 776 in your pew Bible. The stoning of Stephen. When they heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this they covered their ears and yelled at the top of their voices. They all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. 
Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep, and Saul was there giving approval to his death. May the Lord bless this reading of his holy word. Pray with me. O Lord, it was you who caused all Holy Scripture to be written for our learning. Teach us today the power of your Holy, in the power of your Holy Spirit, the truths that you would have us learn. As we pray this in the name of Christ our Savior. Amen. This passage that we are looking at today is what I would call one of the hard passages of the Bible. By that, I mean it's troubling, and I'll, I hope I can f uh, f fill that out just a little bit. I can only imagine how Mel Gibson would treat this if he were to make it into a motion picture. Frankly, it is simply a brutal thing to think about. But on the flip side, this passage is to me another little indication that the Bible really is the Word of God. Because if God, for some reason, put that responsibility on me to write a book that would, would encourage people from all walks of life, all centuries of time, to love God and come to Christ, I'd, I think I'd leave that one out among many others. But the Bible is truly the Word of God because it tells it all, whether it's good, bad, ugly, or what. Now, you may recall about Stephen that he was one of the seven Greek-speaking deacons that were chosen in the sixth chapter of Acts to help quell a little bit of a controversy that had come up in the early church. It seems like that the Greek-speaking widows were kind of being overlooked in the daily potluck lunch, if you want to call it that. So the church said, okay, we're going to take seven men of good report who you know, kind of know what it's like to, to be a Greek speaker in a Jewish culture. And so Stephen did that ministry, but he didn't stop there. He also became a preacher. And he got in trouble with the local Jewish ruling council. So he didn't just simply confine his service to the Lord in serving people. He also preached. And if in the last part of the sixth chapter of Acts, you will read that the local Jewish leaders, trying to undermine this new faith in every way that they could, took his words and twisted them accusing him of saying things that he didn't say. So he ended up before the Sanhedrin. Now the Sanhedrin was the local religious ruling council. The political matters were under uh, Roman control, as we know, um, and the Romans were the political leaders, the Jews were the religious leaders. Stephen's speech before the Sanhedrin, which we did not read today, is a classic. If you want to know Old Testament history, let me give you two ways to do it. One is to start in the Bible on page 1, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, and read all the way through the book of Malachi, which is the last book of the Old Testament. That's one way to learn the Old Testament if you got the time to do it. I think you'll get lost in uh, uh, Leviticus and some of those. It's Anyway, it, it, and by the way, if, if you suffer from insomnia, that possibly could be a cure. The other way to get a, a good summary of Old Testament history is this speech of Stephen. Uh, it is a grand summary of the Old Testament and in closing his argument to the Sanhedrin, he says this, and I'm reading 
from the easy to read version. You, it's hard to say stupid, <laughs> you stubborn Jewish leaders, you refuse to give your hearts to God or even listen to him. You're always against what the Holy Spirit wants you to do. That's how your ancestors were, and you're just like them. They persecuted ever, every prophet who ever lived. They even killed those who long ago said that the righteous one, that is the Messiah, would come. And now you have turned against that righteous one and killed him. You're the people who received God's law, which he gave you through his angels, but you don't obey it. Well, you can imagine the, the reaction to that accusation. They were furious. I wish I had the courage to read the Bible sometimes the way the words are. And you notice when Bennett read that, they, they literally screamed at him. I'm, I'm not going to do that, but, but that's really kind of the way to get the flavor of what was going on that day. They led him out to be stoned. That's easy to say, isn't it? They led him out to be stoned. That very sentence, again, is one of the reasons I think this is one, one of the hard passages of the Bible. Can you imagine death by stoning? You know, maybe the first one that hits you, well, you, you get hurt, but you know, you can survive that. How about when the 20th one hits you? I don't know how big the stones were. Torturous, awful, awful way to die. And unfortunately, I read that stoning is still practiced in parts of the world today. It's a hard passage. It's savage. It's brutal. And all because they didn't like what Stephen had to say. Now, do you suppose Stephen could have avoided that sentence? It's possible he could. I think probably he could have moderated his words just a bit been a little bit less accusatory and confrontive. He could have just not said anything, I suppose, but he was so consumed by the fire of the Holy Spirit that his faith took him far, even to his own death. And the question today is, how far will your faith take you? What is it that you're passionate about? So passionate that you would go so far as to put your life right there on the line. Think about that. In my devotional reading this week, Oswald Chambers had two days that he devoted to another character in the Bible. This man was not named in the Bible so we only know him as the rich young ruler. Now Oswald Chambers wrote the classic devotional book, My Utmost for His Highest. He lived one, just about exactly 100 years ago. I think his theological insights are brilliant, but the reading of them is difficult. And some, some days I read, they're not long, you know, maybe not, no more than what would be printed on one, one of these pages. Some days I read that and I just shake my head. I, I'm not clear what he means by that. But next day I keep reading. I keep reading. Uh, by the way, he is on the web and it's free. If you look up his website, it will come up today's date, the 19th of, of uh, August, I recommend it to you. Now, you know the rich young ruler story. Here was a young man who got really excited about Jesus, and he had a burning desire in his heart to follow Jesus. So he runs up to him, and as a further indication of his respect for Jesus, he even knelt down. 
And he said, I, I, I want to follow you, Lord. I really want to follow you. And wouldn't you know, this week, I got an email which was sent to us through our website where it says, contact us. Uh, it, those emails come to me and to our church secretary. And a young woman wanted to know how to be saved. Well, I, and, and at the bottom she said, please respond. My goodness, I wouldn't think of not responding. And I did, and hopefully she'll come back and we can have a dialogue about that. So Jesus led him through the various commandments. He said, you know what the commandments say. Do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and mother. And he said, Lord, I've done all that. He maybe didn't say it, you know, quite like that. And immediately Jesus sensed that something was missing. So he says to the young man, one more thing you got to do. Go sell all that you possess and give to the poor and you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Well, the young man went away disillusioned and sorrowful. He just couldn't do it. Maybe if he only had a dollar in his pocket, he'd be willing to do that. But, but Jesus laid a requirement on him that was really, really tough. And as Oswald Chambers commented on that, he said, Our Lord never pleaded with him, never tried to lure him, he simply spoke the strictest words that human ears have ever heard and then left him alone. He also comments, Jesus did not show the least concern that this rich young ruler should do what he told him, nor did Jesus make any attempt to keep that man with him. In church life today, that's not how we do it. We make every attempt to keep folks with us. This is a day of declining church membership and participation. And to put it in, in secular terms, we can't afford to take such a strict approach. Or can we? The point is, the demands of the Christian life are just that. They are demands. The Ten Commandments are not the Ten Suggestions, as someone had pointed out. They are strict demands. They are, at times, harsh demands. And I'm sure that each one of us here today have experienced some of those harsh demands of Jesus on our life. So how far will your faith take you? I've often feared that in many instances we have reduced Christianity to a smorgasbord, an old term. We don't use that anymore. We, we say buffet now. But a smorgasbord is a Swedish word that means the same thing. You got all kinds of choices of food. They're dangerous to me. Mm. It's hard to have any, any kind of control or, or uh, discipline or anything like that. But I think some people think of it that way. Okay, I'll just walk down the line. I'll take a little here. Oh, I don't like that. I'll take some over here. But I don't think Jesus ever meant it that way. We would reject the more radical aspects of Christianity, which would maybe call us to be like Stephen or like the rich young ruler. And I used another analogy in the early church. One of the reasons that Carmen and I, if we make it till Tuesday, will be 54 years is because we agree on at least one thing. We don't like to go camping. <laughs> camping for us is a room at the Holiday Inn. Well, it's okay if you don't like something like that, but we don't get to pick and choose in the Christian life. 
eternity hangs in the balance. How far will your faith take you? I often reference Adoniram Judson. He was the first white missionary to go into Burma, which is now called Myanmar. He sweated out the heat of Burma. I thought of Haiti when I read that. For 18 years, without a furlough, no, no vacation, the first six of those years, he didn't even have a single convert. In fact, there was no, uh, I think it's called a lexicon of the Burmese language, and he wrote one. Enduring torture and imprisonment, he said that he never saw a ship sail away from Burma, but that he didn't wish he was on board that. His wife's health broke. And he put her on a vessel headed back, knowing that if she lived, it would be at least two years before she could get back. And he wrote in his diary, If we could find some quiet resting place on earth where we could spend the rest of our days in peace, dot, dot, dot. He didn't, didn't finish it. But he went on to say, Life is short. Millions of Burmese are perishing. I am almost the only person on earth who has attained their language to communicate salvation. His faith led him to Burma, and it wasn't easy. What is it in your life, perhaps, that you're withholding from God? What calling maybe you're ignoring or even actively running from? What is it maybe that God is trying to speak to you that you're just turning a deaf ear toward God? I wish I didn't have to say this, but to be honest and direct, church life in America is in trouble. So many things compete with gathering God's people together. We're, we're mobile, so much more than our parents were. We're much more affluent than earlier generations, therefore opening up all kinds of choices. And most often the choice we make, it doesn't start with a C and end with an H, as in church. Well, I can't change anybody but me, so let's just be faithful in our own lives. We can't change others. You, can, you and I both can let our faith take us as far as God wants us to go. In yesterday's wedding, as part of my charge that I gave to this young couple, I told them they needed to be active in church now, the groom is a member of our church, but it doesn't have to be our church. A church, a good church. Two little children were involved in that marriage. And I said to them, your church can help you teach them about Jesus. Your church can be a place of refuge. It can be a place of service, a place of learning, and a place of salvation. And I say that same thing to all of you. We need someone who can bring us to the Father, and that is our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we're so timid with our faith. We too often shy away from being a full-fledged disciple, ready to go where you want us to go. Give us courage. Give us boldness to go where our faith would lead us. As we pray this through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Oh, the closing hymn has been changed. I meant to announce that. We're going to, the, the number in your program was wrong anyway. Uh, we're going to sing Just As I Am, number 488. <laughs>
forth from here as a child of God and let your faith lead you where God wants you to go. Go in peace. Amen. Thank you.